Please welcome to the stage, Nate Nickerson. And everybody else. Anywhere you like. I'll take this one. Anywhere you like. All right, we've got about 25 minutes before lunch. We have a million questions. I won't get to all of them, but I looked through um, uh, the ones that we got in so far, and I've tried to pull out the ones that were most common or seemed uh, richest. OK, sorry. So there was um, almost all the questions are about the issues themselves, but I want to start with um, one very good one about MIT itself. Um, so the question is, how does MIT promote interdisciplinary research? into cybersecurity, that is, combining policy, IT, design, monitoring. Can, can you all talk about various ways in which you're working with people outside of your own shops? <laughs> How are you? Where do you want to start? Well, let me start by saying that uh, there is nobody in my own shop, my department, that works on cyber-related issues or cybersecurity. Um, and um, so, mercifully, there are colleagues in other areas that have made that possible in the Sloan School, in computer sciences, et cetera. Um, and uh, that, that interaction is, is really uh, leading us to rethink the curriculum in, in my field. So I think when we do it well, we actually get dragged by our students to do it. Um, we have just an increasing number of students who are coming in. Uh, they're, they're course six students, or they're students from, from other, other departments who are, who are, you know, got core engineering skills, and they want to be able to apply those skills to, to policy questions. Um, our challenge is to keep up with that <laughs> and, 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 and create opportunities for that. Um, uh, we have a, a, a large initiative that we're just launching, uh, a, as I mentioned, where we'll be bringing together students and faculty uh, from uh, across the campus, from political science, from Sloan, from science, technology, and society, from various engineering schools, uh, and we're going to we're going to work on these problems. What I, uh, you know, I, I I think that as I look at the kinds of challenges that that we need to face. Uh, following uh, you know, uh, President Reif's exhortation that what we're about here is doing good, um, one of the things we're very focused on doing is, is having lots of interaction with, uh, with policymakers, with people in the, in the private sector, with people in civil society, so that we understand what kinds of problems uh, need solving, uh, uh, and, th and that we can, uh, ourselves as researchers and our students, can really be part of a, of a dialogue with the larger world. These are very applied research questions. Uh, um, we obviously need fundamental research skills and background, but ultimately our goal is to, is to be able to uh, learn how to apply the, the capabilities that we have here. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll just give one very quick example. Uh, this spring semester, we taught a uh, course jointly uh, with Georgetown Law School. So we had a bunch of law students and a bunch of uh, uh, course six students. Uh, we gave them a crash course in privacy law, a crash course in technologies relevant to privacy issues, and we told them to go solve a bunch of, of, of privacy legislation problems. They came out with extraordinary uh, uh, results. So that's, that's the way we're going to do this. Yeah, I, oh, go ahead. I, I would just have to say that I think actually collaboration is essential to all the projects that I do. Because one of the things that I'm trying to think about is how do we use data and analytics to really solve problems, but how do we communicate that to a larger public? And how do we pick and pinpoint those policy issues that are important? And in, in order to do that, you need to have a policy person on your team. You need to have a data visualizer on your team. You need to have that quantitative person on your team that they can all speak to each other and kind of collectively create something that can create a broader message in the world. And I really think for our data to make a good, teams are absolutely essential. Yeah, I think MIT is a great place to foster collaboration across multiple dimensions. You know, in, in my personal case, you know, I was a professor in the math department doing theoretical research, but there was the lab structure, in my case, the lab for computer science, now the CS and AI lab. 
And that brought together people from different backgrounds. So in fact, before I knew it, I had an office in the lab for computer science that was down the hall from Tim Berners-Lee, who we all know is the, the father of the web. And that got us thinking about how would our theoretical research be useful to solve real problems on the internet. Um, and then we you know, developed a lot of technology there. And it would have stayed academic, except there's the Sloan School here, and they have you know, this thing that is now called the 100K business plan competition. Then it was the 50K. Uh, and that got us engaged with uh, other entrepreneurs, industry experts, venture capitalists. Uh, so we started thinking about, OK, well, forming a company. And then you, you fast forward even to today, you know, I'm now the, the CEO of a, a public company and uh, on leave from MIT, and MIT has you know, been you know, very gracious to make that work, and I, but I still teach every other fall. And so I come back in, and now you have somebody who really is now you know, uh, in industry bringing that experience into the classroom so the process can help to restart you know, with the students. And uh, MIT is very good at being flexible and bringing people together from different environments. Yeah, I think I would just like to add to that is that uh, one of the greatest resources for me at MIT is we, there is such a wide variety of people working on pretty much everything that you can imagine. And that there are, mo much more importantly, is that there are literally no boundaries uh, between departments or between different labs. And uh, so most of my collaborators are in uh, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, material science, and some of them are from physics. But you okay. never pay any attention to who is in which department when I work with people. Or I, I, there is nothing that m makes me or in, uh, even think about it. Great, thank you, you guys. And so um, we're going to move on to a different question. I can say that for the stack of questions in my hand, I would say 80% of them could be summarized as "You're really scaring me." Okay. <laughs> So, 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 but one person asked sort of uh, the, the kind of question that follows that, which is, um, uh, he or she asks, can the panelists give us elements of hope that things will or can get better? Well, that's what MIT's here for, right? <laughs> is to make things better through, through technology and then policy and uh, relations with industry and government. Uh, and yes, we can make things better. Here's one of the things that I think, <laughs> I agree. Uh, one of the things I think we learn when we start situating uh, technology questions like, like, like network security questions or other kinds of security questions in a, in a policy context is, is you, you start thinking about these questions as not so much questions of uh, as a kind of a binary matter, is a system secure or not, but more as a matter of risk. How secure is it? What are the vulnerabilities? How much do you invest in, 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 in mitigating risk? And I think part of the, part of the scariness comes in a feel it, from, from a sense that nothing's perfectly secure, so therefore everything must be completely insecure. And of course, we know the world is more complicated than that. We have large systems today. Our financial system moves just enormous amounts of money. Maybe you know how much money it moves. I don't know, but it moves a lot of money, uh, as probably more as, as many dollars as web pages, if not if not uh, more by a few orders of magnitude. And yeah, we lose some of the money along the way, but we have a lot of of stabilizing. We do. So live with it, right? I mean, the the world has not come to an end because billions of dollars of cash get lost in the ATM network every single year. Billions and billions. Um, but still, uh, we, we, you know, we, we, we managed to function. And I think part of what, what we hope to understand in our, in our cybersecurity policy research is just what is the nature of those kinds of, those, the, 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 those kind of equilibria, those kind of feedback mechanisms that allow us to function with a reasonable amount of trust in the face of some fundamental insecurity. To follow up with a slightly different idiom, I think about the proverbial blind man and, and the elephant. Uh, in, in the old days, the silos of fields yeah, were like the various blind men. And now we're beginning to appreciate that in order for things to be get better, we have to have a little bit more realistic um, models, concepts, uh, understanding and representing the understanding of, of areas that are dynamically changing very, very quickly. Um, and the reason I think that this is good news 
is that we're beginning to push against the conventional um, con concepts we have, at least in, in my field, example being um, developing coursework and uh, research material on the concept of, of cyber politics, because to me, all the issues we've been talking about today are intensely political, having to do with who gets what, when, and how, and with what, with what impact. Yeah, so um, for me, I guess the issue about scariness was more about this uh, internet security. Transparent displays are probably not that scary. But I guess uh, the, I oh, personally... There was a question for you about whether all your work is safe. So we'll ask <laughs> <Okay>. that now. <laughs> so uh, about, uh, I'm certainly extreme technology optimist. I personally uh, believe that uh, technology is the biggest force uh, for good that we have in our society. It's what brought us from dark ages to where we are today. Uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, one could or should uh, do technology, whatever it takes us, it, uh, to make to really release most of the good things out of technology requires a complex interaction between you know, people who come up with the technology and the uh, society who pays attention to what's happening uh, from social sciences, scientists, uh, 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 people who do policy, uh, economists, and so on. So it's this collaboration that ultimately makes technology, uh, bring out good things out of technology and uh, prevents bad things out of technology uh, from happening. And in sense of being scared, uh, I would say that's a positive thing when people are scared care, then they pay attention to what's, what's going on. Yeah. Great. Um, so I will, I will ask a question um, that came in online. I think it's probably for you, Tom. Um, it is probably the most brass tax question, which is, OK, what makes a good password? <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible at that, because I can never remember my passwords. It's really, uh, well, yeah, that's, that's hard. The best thing is not to just have a password, but to have you know, uh, a second form of authentication. There's uh, cards that will change the password every 60 seconds. That can be useful. Uh, there can be biometric data. Uh, generally, the ha passwords that we use, I know the passwords that I use are not very secure. Uh, even though the system allows it, it's, that's just a hard way to do things. Mm -hmm. The answer is, there is no such thing. <laughs> <laughs> You're scaring is, is. them again. <laughs> um, Nasli, I think this one is for you. This is from someone here um, who writes, I suspect we are at war and just don't recognize it with each cyber attack taking the place of conventional battles. Is that, is that, a, way, is that a useful way to think about what's going on? Um, if Useful, I'm not quite sure. There is an escalation dynamics going on, and that usually happens before you get a conflict and violence. Um, I, I think the really interesting thing would be to think about the, the physical world we know about, arms race, escalation, et cetera, and ask, uh, how do we get reversal of relationship? How do we get an arms race to kind of go down as opposed to go up? And is there an equivalent in, um, in the cyber domain? Uh, at this point, uh, Traditional models would be that the United States as a major power is there, China is challenging it, and history tells us that there's a almost inevitable collision points there. But it's dangerous to use history uncritically uh, as, a, as, as, a, uh, as a model of precedent for how to interpret what we now have. Can I just suggest that it, it does feel like we're, we're at war because we hear about these attacks that go, go back and forth. Um, uh, my own view is that what we have in, in, in these cyber attacks is much more like piracy in the 17th and 18th century than it is really a full-blown war. I mean, the pirates, uh, piracy was a, a actually relatively stable economy that kind of existed alongside of a whole series of wars. Um, and it, and, and it, it, it had a certain equilibrium about it. The, the British Royal Navy sent out uh, captains in ships to go and you know, interdict pirates, and the captains got 20% of the, 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 the value of the ship when it was captured. And everyone was, it wasn't great. It imposed, a, it imposed cost on commerce, and it imposed risk for individuals. But it was actually a somewhat stabilized environment. Um, uh, and I would suggest that probably that's the best analogy we have. Large enterprises, when they decide how to invest in cybersecurity um, uh, threat detection services, are known to distribute the, um, 
their spending amongst different uh, uh, cybersecurity consultants based on the ones that have the best connection to different uh, 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 black hat hacker gangs. So you want it, So if you're a big bank, you want to make sure that you've paid, you know, that one of your cyber consultants is someone who knows the Albanian gang, and the other consultant is someone who knows uh, uh, you know, a Malaysian gang, and, and on and on and on. And, and so, um, <clears throat> Uh, this is not a great set of circumstances, but, but, but I don't think it's a war, exactly. Uh, I think it, it will, we know that war warlike activity now, in the case of Israel and, Ga and, 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 and Gaza as an example, have, has a cyber dimension now. Probably all wars in the future will have a cyber dimension. But I don't think we should confuse what is this sort of real uh, uh, constant level of attack with a war just because it sometimes is connected to nation states. Got it, all right, thank you. Um, we've got a question, uh, Sarah, this one's directed uh, for you, but others can chime in too, so um, on, the, on the general issue of models with all this work. So uh, Sarah, the question is, um, do your big data urban systems models, uh, are they built using systems dynamics models like those developed by Jay Forrester and Urban Dynamics and others? Just a general question about the models. Um, I, so um, the models that I develop, I think, are very different from the Forrester models. Um, and those are the models of uh, the kind of six, 60s that came, came out of MIT. And um, how they're different is that they, those models were criticized for not having human input or human um, uh, narratives. Um, and so for kind of being able to um, transform in real time, so they often modeled a particular time and place but became out of time very quickly or very rapidly. So the models I developed try to take in real time data, but also try to um, incorporate more qualitative human experience in terms of thinking about how we want to apply those to place, right? Um, and I think many of the models, uh, Forrester's models have been criticized for marginalizing communities. And what I hope the models I do is actually help to um, uh, kind of elevate those people on the margins of society. Got it. Um, so Tom, there's a question about, um, and there are a couple about kind of the question of open source technology and whether that is helpful in security issues. And if you could just kind of talk about that. Yeah, no, I, I think open source is uh, uh, very important. Uh, we're still big believers in open source. We embrace it. We fund the open source groups. We uh, don't trust it uh, in the way that we did before. Uh, and I think the community as a whole used to just trust it. And uh, I think that's gone. Uh, so we, you, know, you, you need to think about it as if an adversary developed it, just if it came from a, a foreign government or a, a company. Um, but it's still, I think, very important. And we're still big supporters of open source. Uh, so it's just that the trust issue is, is not what it was. Got it. Mm. You, you know, I just say, I think there's a pretty critical um, collaboration and interoperability component of open source software. Lot, lots of the interoperability we used to have in computers and network systems would come more either uh, uh, from one monopoly provider who could control a standard or from kind of traditional standards bodies that would go through you know, wh whatever sort of uh, um, kind of quasi-political process of agreeing on a, a technology design that everyone could then adopt around which you could have interoperability. I think what's interesting about the open source environment, not, not to take, not to in any way disagree with, with Tom, is that open source software development is increasingly the venue for, 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 for developing collaborative and, 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 and interoperable software uh, systems. It's just, ra so rather than arguing about a, a, a spec, people just write code and then kind of contribute to it. Uh, you know, a great example of that is, is the Bitcoin code base. Um, uh, several of the, the and, and you do have this interesting, uh, dynamics there where a small number of so-called committers um, actually end up controlling um, uh, the, the direction of a whole open source technology community. Um, uh, that can work well or that can have uh, glitches to it. Um, so Maren, as I, um, as I promised, there is a question for you about um, the health considerations around using nanotechnology and what, what, whether, there, whether there are any that you worry about. 
Oh, that's a very important question, yeah. So, uh, and that's something that people study quite a bit because, you know, some of these particles, just by the feature that they are small, uh, could do something to us that we are not aware of because it's for the first time that we are dealing with some of these things. So some of them are so small that they could enter into uh, smaller than the pores of your membrane so they could enter it. So for example, for uh, so for the transparent displays, it's uh, you know, less critical because they end up being imbe firmly embedded into polymer. Uh, but like for example, for smoke grenades, that's something that you know, soldiers would inhale very much, right? So, uh, so as a part of that project, for example, we had a, a also a office of US Army that's working kind of with us, paying attention to that particular issue. That's very important, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got a, um, a couple of questions, so I'll ask it kind of generally to the panel. Um, got a couple of questions about the Internet of Things, which was touched on in at least one presentation today. So the question is, for the Internet of Things, what are the key security considerations in your mind? That's okay, a, question. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a huge challenge. Uh, you know, on the one hand, you have a proliferation of devices that are well connected, using uh, well understood software that has, in many cases, well known vulnerabilities, uh, has a, now increasingly a, a, a very strong processing capability. Uh, and all this is for good but it can also be co-opted to, to do bad things. Uh, and so we talked about the reflection attacks where literally we see refrigerators, you know, can participate in attacks on, on banks, uh, for example. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's also, as we increasingly rely on these devices, your thermostat, your car, uh, everything you have, people can penetrate that software. There's already examples where researchers have taken over people's cars. Uh, and d demonstrated that while you're driving the car, they can take over the functioning of the car through the internet or through uh, whatever communication channel that the, the car is connected with. Uh, you know, and so that has the potential to do very bad things. Uh, and as we talk about, is there ever going to be a cyber war? You know, already you see examples where our government has claimed to have released a virus that, you know, corrupted, uh, you know, Iranian nuclear. Uh, infrastructure, nuclear facility infrastructure, that was one th once thought to be impossible because it's you know, not even connected to the internet, but we've shown it can be done. And now that's out there. And so you worry about all of our infrastructure. And as more and more of it becomes connected, uh, becomes part of the internet of things, all for good reasons, it increases vulnerabilities. And security is a, is a big issue there. Well, you know, in some ways, we're in the middle of something of a paradox because on the one hand, the internet and associated technologies have empowered the individual, thee and me, in ways that have never been the case before. On the other hand, it also provided vulnerabilities and sensitivities that we've never had before. So what do we do here? You know, exactly where are the intervention points that would protect the empowerment, the freedom, et cetera, and, and reduce the vulnerabilities? I think that... There's, to me, two very particular challenges about the Internet of Things, which is not a phrase I love, but um, uh, number one, I think there is a real management challenge. Um, as Tom gave the example of Heartbleed, well, what's the response to Heartbleed? Patch your software, uh, update your software. So it's, it's going to be harder to think of how to manage an infrastructure of you know, potentially billions of little tiny devices that are scattered around that are not all that visible, where it's not clear who's really responsible for patching them. They can become attack vectors. They can have their own vulnerabilities. So, so there's really going to be a big management question. I think people who are b designing the infrastructures, some of these Internet of Things infrastructures, are, are aware of that. But that's going to be a kind of orders of magnitude bigger management problem than we have with desktop devices or even mobile devices. And the second is this shift from uh, uh, you know, systems that are just about kind of abstract representation and computation, which is mostly what we have today, to systems that are actuators, that are actually having some effect, in, a direct effect in the world, not, not instructing someone to take an effect, but, but you know, mm -hmm. adding more insulin to your bloodstream or giving your heart a little kick when it needs it or, uh, uh, you know, who, who knows what else fixing your eye, you know, fixing the lens in your eye. So I think, I think that we haven't really taken seriously, well, it's, it's kind of to Nasley's point, we, we really have emphasized flexibility, 
and uh, dynamic design in the internet environment, because we figured you could always fix it later, <laughs> uh, which is true. Um, uh, but, but for these more embedded devices that have more immediate effect, um, we probably have to think a little differently about the safety uh, questions. All right, we're almost out of time, but there's one more question I found really interesting, and it's for Nasli. So the question is, where do multinational and supranational corporations fit in your picture of things? Oh, they are, um, we don't have any precedent for the size and scale and scope and penetration out into our daily life of entities like Apple, Google, et cetera, from, from the user point of view. Uh, now, Google was born as an American company, so we're very comfortable with the, the size, I'm using that as an example. But if Google were born as a Chinese company and had reached the scale and scope of what it now had, we would really be more worried. So to answer the question directly, um, it has to do, the reality out there is changing in such a way that it leads to a slight, no, to a reduction in the ability of the state system, countries, to manage and control the private sector and uh, in those instances, um, and the, the absence of any kind of accountability mechanisms, as far as I can understand, for the behavior of uh, uh, the Googles, the Apples, and so forth, uh, other than voluntary and peer pressure, which I think is a good thing, uh, but can an entire international system rest its order on, on those principles, voluntary and, and peer pressure? Well, we have a stack that could keep us going for another two hours, but we won't. Uh, please join me in thanking today's speakers. Thank you.